Welcome back everyone, it's the lawyer you know for our second update on the Kleiman v. Wright trial. Make sure you subscribe to our page and like this video so we know there's enough interest in this video. It's a little out of the ordinary for us, but we wanna know if you guys are interested and if you're gonna keep watching. So make sure you subscribe and like this video and we'll keep talking about this case as long as it goes on. And this is unlike any other civil trial in America that I've seen because the amount of the potential verdict changes every day with the value of Bitcoin and what the plaintiff, Ira Kleiman, on behalf of his deceased brother, Dave Kleiman, is going after from Satoshi, AKA Craig Wright. And yes, Satoshi, I'll do my best to learn this pronunciation because I was corrected many times in the last video. I welcome that, I appreciate that. Anybody here listening probably knows more than I do about digital currency, so bear with me. I'm trying to break down the trial. I find this really interesting as a civil trial here in my home state of Florida, so I'm looking at it just as a civil trial lawyer would. I rely on you guys in the comments to educate me on Bitcoin if you feel so inclined. So this is just another reminder at the beginning of the video that I'm not gonna be explaining what Bitcoin is, how it's mined or anything like that, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how things work in the courtroom with a case like this with people that are used to dealing with technology and computers and data and how that actually comes into play when you have to have rock solid proof to prove something by the preponderance of the evidence and what that actually means and do you need a smoking gun and what could that look like? So we're gonna pick up with some testimony from Jonathan Warren who's a computer scientist who apparently created BitMessage. He talks in his testimony about, I think it was actually a deposition reading, but he talks in his testimony about the fact that Craig Wright can basically forge or edit some of these bit messages to benefit him. And in Cross, they talked about the fact that, well, some of these messages apparently happened before he ever created BitMessage and how's that uh, possible? And then uh, Jonathan Warren actually admitted that, well, maybe Craig and I talked using this before it was actually launched. So one of these, you know, things again, dealing with technology to me, yet another witness that didn't actually prove anything for the plaintiff. Because that's what it is. To say, oh, this could have been forged, doesn't sound like evidence that something was forged or altered, right? Oh, he could have done something like this. Sounds like speculation, which again, I would object to, unless they're just saying that, yes, bit messages can get edited, can get forged, then fine, but they can't speculate that Craig Wright did it unless they have evidence of that. You're not allowed to, in court, argue something you don't have any evidence of and you don't have a good faith or a reasonable basis to believe that what you're actually arguing is true. So that's gonna be important as we continue to go through some of these witnesses. Deborah Kobza, Kobza, I have no idea, founder of a nonprofit organization that worked with Craig Wright as a consultant. She was brought purely to say, Craig Wright filled out this application for a $28 million license of some sort. Here's my signature on it. That is not my signature. I'm gonna say that signature was forged, but I have no evidence that Craig Wright actually forged that signature. Again, intimations. Well, Craig Wright filled out this application. He did not have authority or authorization to fill this out on behalf of this nonprofit, which in fact failed. But she's saying, I didn't sign off on it. That's not my signature, although it does say my name. So again, they're trying to build this Craig's a bad guy. He forges stuff, he edits stuff, but no hard evidence that I've seen so far to hold on to to yes, he actually did that. Ramona Watts is the next testimony we're gonna talk about. It is Craig Wright's wife. Um, they showed her a quote, I can't remember if it was from an email, that basically said, the Dave stuff is practically non-existent on paper. I understand you wiped a lot, but a final trawl through your digital universe might give me something that connects the two of you, Dave and Craig, arguably to the invention. Very interesting. But again, no real corroboration or explanation or expansion on that, because Dave's not here to tell us what exactly the nature of their relationship was. Her testimony was also that Craig Wright never told her that he mined Bitcoin with Dave Kleiman, never told her that they had a partnership together, nothing. She also talked a little bit about his Asperger's, which is gonna come in a lot because we are gonna talk about Satoshi's testimony himself, but she said he is literal beyond anything. And that's gonna be important for a couple reasons, legally speaking, as we talk through Craig Wright um, and his testimony. Oh, Hannigan, I guess, wrote a book about this Bitcoin and Satoshi and 
Um, there's some quotes in there about how Dave helped Craig throughout the process, edited some things for him, expanded on some things. Um, there was a quote that said, I was the main part of it from Craig. Other people helped. At the end of the day, none of this would have happened without Dave Kleiman, without Hal Finney, and without those people who took it over like Gavin and Mike, okay? He did a lot of interviews, had quotes from Craig Wright. Again, a lot of conjecture, a lot of just kind of fluff talk, nothing that this hard evidence of a partnership of this magnitude with this many Bitcoins. And, and this is just another example, and we're gonna talk about you know Craig's testimony now, that's the big kahuna here for us to talk about, but he's talking throughout his testimony that he wanted to pump Dave up because he was afraid nobody would remember him and he loved Dave and he got emotional on the stand. But with so much conjecture throughout most of this testimony, this is why I would be shocked if you saw any criminal charges coming from anything Craig Wright did, which you may say, oh, well, duh, but this is a quasi criminal case, forgery, theft, misappropriation of funds, all of those things, fraud, all of those things have criminal elements. And this is a quasi criminal case, but you're not going to find any criminal charges because the burden of beyond a reasonable doubt, no U S attorney, in my opinion, would ever bring charges with this evidence. Now, someone looking for money and someone with a civil background trying to, you know, get this big windfall of 500,000 Bitcoin. Well, maybe it's worth it to them to take the chance, but I just can't see the U S attorney going after Craig Wright with this kind of evidence that we've seen in this trial so far. So some interesting factors about Craig Wright himself testifying and being called by the plaintiff in a case. Craig Wright's the defendant, but the plaintiff calls him in his case in chief. Is that possible? How's that fair? Can't he just say no, no, not in a civil trial. In a criminal defense case, the prosecution cannot call the defendant in their case in chief because the defendant can invoke his Fifth Amendment right. There is no Fifth Amendment right in a civil trial. Now, you can invoke it if you think your response is going to elicit something criminal. You can invoke your Fifth Amendment right in a civil trial, but you, not, you cannot refuse to take the stand as a defendant. You're a party in the case. You can be a witness in the case. The plaintiff can call you, and they did here. Now, the defense can also call you in their case in chief, and in this case, it seems like the defense is not gonna cross-examine Craig Wright right now. Instead, they're gonna wait till their case in chief, then they're gonna call him to the stand and take care of any in, uh, discrepancies or inconsistencies at that time. I thought it was interesting when he was you know, told, sworn under oath to tell the truth, nothing but the truth and the whole truth. He said, I swear to God, I will tell the truth. And throughout his testimony, I thought it was really interesting that Craig Wright would turn to the jury and explain things to them. He would also correct the plaintiff's attorney if he would ask something or say something he felt was, was incorrect. He would also explain certain terms that I would need ex explanation of, and this jury probably would too, if they're technical terms that he could define for them to help them better understand what's happening and what's going on. And that's important because that shows his command, that shows his authority and his knowledge and expertise in this world, and that he was able to do this right? Because one of the things the defense is arguing is that Dave wasn't even able to do this. And throughout his testimony, he said he couldn't code. Dave wasn't able to code. He edited some stuff for me, but he wasn't writing code. He wasn't mining Bitcoin. There were also some emails and documents presented to Craig Wright that contradicted that, where he said, Dave's good with code. Hal's better. I think it was Hal. Somebody is better. Dave was okay. So, you know, maybe some contradictions. They did that throughout his testimony as well. And as part of some of the correcting that I talked about where, where Craig would correct some of the things the plaintiff's lawyer said, he also pointed out that that Thanksgiving Day story was totally bogus and that Dave nor Craig created this Bitcoin logo. So he decided to point that out and he pulled some semantics and there was a lot of nitpicking going on throughout this. And that's fine and that happens with a lot of witnesses, especially a defendant. But when you need hard actual evidence to prove your case, this nitpicking only goes so far, in my opinion, as a lawyer. So a couple of the potential smoking guns from the plaintiff that, again, they're trying to draw con conjecture of is emails where Craig Wright said he and Dave were partners. There was a partnership. They worked together when he told Ira Kleiman that Dave might have some Bitcoin. So he may want to look into that or don't destroy the hard drives. Those smoking guns, again, were just, I mean, I'm saying smoking guns with quotes because they were just conjecture and speculation. And you have to take steps to say, well, we need context. What kind of partnership? What did they do in that partnership? 
What did they own in that partnership? How was it split up? Why do we automatically think it was 50-50? All that stuff is important, especially when couched in the fact that both of these guys, Dave and Craig, had lots of other partnerships and LLCs that were in writing, split appropriately, and done the legal and the correct way. Also, the, the um, uplifting talk and speech with both of them. They loved each other, it seems. Now, you could argue, why didn't Craig help him out a little bit? It seems like Craig's got a lot of money and Dave died destitute, basically. So why didn't he help him out if he loved him so much and he was his best friend? That's besides the point, something maybe the plaintiff will bring up in closing arguments. But as they talk through this, you can see that Craig really did love Dave. And one of his explanations for saying Dave was a partner and had stuff had something to do with the Satoshi uh, pseudonym was he just wanted to talk Dave up and let him be remembered. But he also said Dave never really did anything that significant. But he was there for Craig when nobody else was. And Craig gave him credit saying, you know what, maybe none of this would have happened with Dave. Maybe you're right. Maybe I wouldn't be here without Dave. He was here through some of my toughest times in life. Even though he pushed me to pursue Bitcoin, which may have led to my divorce, he was there for me when nobody else was. He was such an important figure to me and he got emotional when talking about Dave. So that's his explanation. He seems to have an explanation for everything the, plaintiff said, the plaintiffs are arguing, but the problem is it's because it's all fluff. It's all speculation, in my opinion. So if they're going to say, ha-ha, you guys were partners. Ha-ha, you thank Dave all the time. Craig can say, yeah, I talked him up. He was my best friend. We were partners in life. Like, we were there for each other. Because without context, Craig Wright's testimony is evidence. What the lawyers are arguing and trying to intimate is not evidence. Now, the emails are, but they don't have context, and Craig's testimony gives them context that the jury can hold on to. So that's important to me. The discussion about the fact that Dave may have had Bitcoin, and he told Ira that. How can that be explained? Well, Dave could have mined Bitcoin on his own. He could have bought Bitcoin. He could have had Bitcoin after the fact. And maybe Craig was just being nice to Ira saying, hey, don't delete those. There could be a key wallet. You don't understand how Bitcoin works. I do, like, like I'm saying, I wouldn't keep a computer of a dead relative. So he reached out and Craig said, hey, you may want to keep that. There could be something valuable on there. That's an explanation. Do we believe it? I don't know. You tell me. Do you, was, was Craig Wright believable? I guess we can't watch this trial like some of the other ones, but do you believe that? Do you believe that that's possible, these explanations? And the problem is whether or not the jury believes it there still has to be evidence for them to hold on to. Because in appeal or in a directed verdict, the standard is no evidence that a reasonable jury could find in favor of the plaintiff. And I expect the defense to make that argument. Now, 99% of the time a directed verdict is not granted, but still there has to be some kind of evidence that the partnership actually existed the way that the plaintiffs claimed. All right, let's talk about the best piece of evidence that I've seen from the plaintiff so far. And that's corporate documents that show Dave Kleiman transferring 573,500 Bitcoin to Craig Wright. That seems pretty damning, especially when they put people on to say that he forged documents, he forged signatures. There is actually proof of that Bitcoin going from Dave Kleiman to Craig Wright. Now, in my opinion, I read through a lot of the explanation of how they discussed this and what it was like, and it seems very confusing. A lot of Craig Wright's testimony to me seems very confusing, like they didn't do a great job streamlining it, which when you're dealing with somebody who's self-proclaimed Asperger's and a genius and talking about all these things that a lot of people don't understand, it can easily get confusing, which is tough on a lawyer because it's our job to simplify things to juries who are lay people and try to help them understand, which is why lawyers become experts in things that they take cases. So these lawyers are probably experts on Bitcoin now. If I were to take a case like this, I'd have to do a full dive into Bitcoin. And that happens in some cases. In a criminal case, I remember we had a Medicare fraud and I became an expert in all the Medicare coding for that, right? Just for that case, kind of forgot a lot about it now, but you have to dive in and you have to simplify it to a jury. And it did not seem simplified throughout this. Now, that 573,000 Bitcoin. How does the defense argue this? Well, one of the arguments is gonna be, Dave never tried to lay claim to that, and he was apparently destitute. And Craig Wright's explanation with the Australian taxation office. Now, this is important to me and this is interesting. A lot of conjecture can be made for this, and a lot can be used in closing arguments by the lawyers. 
So Craig's story is basically that he transferred this money to Dave and did other things to try to finagle assets because the ATO was coming after him because they didn't like him and they were targeting him and it was totally unfair. And Dave being his best friend helped him out, took this money or this Bitcoin and then transferred it back to Craig. That's his story and he's sticking to it. And Dave's not here again to say that that's not true. So the only evidence of this is a document which on its face does not explain why the money was transferred. There's no contract. There's no partnership agreement. There's no document saying here, I'm giving you this money. It's your money. I'm paying this to you. Craig Wright explains it as he transferred it back to me. And, and it seems like there's corroborating evidence that stuff was going on with the ATO. So that seems like a win for Craig Wright, right? Or in closing argument, can the plaintiff's lawyer say, it's not all conjecture, members of the jury. We've got all these documents and all these emails. And we also have, by Craig Wright's own admission, he is willing to move things around and finagle things and give money to people that doesn't belong to them and put this Bitcoin into somebody else's wallet, even though it's not his, and represent to the ATO that he doesn't have it. It's over here. It's Dave Clements. It's in the United States. He's willing to do that. He's willing to do whatever it takes for him to come out on top and to prove his point and to make sure he protects his assets. So they can use that argument and that's actually evidence that Craig Wright did do this in order to circumvent or to bypass or to misrepresent or whatever you want to call it to the ATO in order to protect his assets. So why wouldn't he do it here to Dave Kleiman? I think that's the best argument the plaintiffs had kind of so far throughout this case. Another interesting point, during Craig Wright's testimony, they start getting into what some of his assets are worth, how much money he has. And if you know anything about civil cases, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to get into how much money a defendant has, how much money he's worth, because the jury is not supposed to have that in their mind when they come up with a verdict, especially in this case, it looks like you're asking for something specific, not a piece of what the defendant um, has. But there is an exception. If you're claiming punitive damages and the court is allowing you to ask for punitive damages to punish the defendant, then you're allowed to go into how much money the defendant has because the point of punitive damages is to hurt the defendant. And if a defendant is worth a billion dollars and you give them punitive damages of a thousand dollars, they're not going to care. Now, if somebody makes minimum wage and you charge them a thousand dollars, it's going to hurt. But somebody worth a billion, maybe you want to give them a couple hundred thousand dollars, a couple million dollars, so they feel it a little bit or a lot, depending on how bad you feel like their conduct is. And because of some of the fraud and allegations that the plaintiff is bringing against the defendant, they have a reasonable basis to ask for punitive damages. And because of that, they're allowed to get into some of the background, how much money he has. That's a big question people have. Why are they able to get into that? Because defense attorneys really try to block this kind of, of discussion. But in this case, they were able to get into some of it. So as Craig Wright's testimony is winding down, one of the jurors gets feverish, has COVID, they break early for that day. So some of my overarching themes of what's going on in this case is that there are tons of emails and documents being presented. It's clear, Dave and Craig were friends, they worked on stuff together, they may have even partnered in some things. It's clear they speak highly of each other. But it's also clear that throughout all this, there's not one official document making them partners. There's not one official document splitting this Bitcoin. In fact, out of all these emails, only one back in March of 2008 even mentions Bitcoin. Dave Kleiman died destitute, not making claim to any of this. In his will, he doesn't mention any of this. He had a fiance, didn't leave her any Bitcoin. It seems like if this guy, Dave Kleiman, had a right to a couple million dollars, he probably would have laid claim to it before he died with no money. So if he wasn't arguing for it and he wasn't trying to get it legally, why should Ira Kleiman after his death get it? And this is one of the big things. I'll finish with this. I've gone on probably longer than you care to hear. But I'll finish with this. In cases when the estate of a plaintiff brings a case, you as the plaintiff's lawyer have to explain to the jury why it is still important that they give a verdict to the estate even though the plaintiff is gone. And in this case, all the evidence seems to point to the fact that Ira and Dave had an estranged relationship. 
The fiance mentioned a different brother to Craig Wright when she reached out after Dave died, said that the brother died, he had no other siblings. He didn't know about it until later that Ira Kleiman even existed. So the plaintiff has to explain to this jury why it is still worth it and important to give this money to Ira Kleiman and Dave Kleiman's estate. Because you tell me, I think as a juror out there, if you think maybe there was a partnership, but now that Dave is dead, who deserves this Bitcoin? The partner left over from the two guys that got these million Bitcoin? Or should we give it to the brother that he never talked to and didn't help him at the end of his life? Jurors are not supposed to have sympathy on the defendant or the plaintiff, but they are allowed to see what's fair and what's just. Who deserves these Bitcoin? Because if there's no partnership, that's what it may come down to. Should they give it to Craig Wright, who we feel like at least has a right to some of these Bitcoin, or to the estate and to Ira Kleiman? Not Dave Kleiman. He's not going to get the benefit of these Bitcoins. Just some food for thought. You guys tell me what you think. How would you break this case down? What would you need to see that to see and to prove that a partnership existed and that this estate should get this Bitcoin? Let me know. Let me know in the comments. We're going to keep trying to do these once a week until this trial ends. Give me some feedback. What do you guys think? What do you like? What do you not like? Make sure you subscribe to our page so you can follow along with this trial and like this video if you're here for this content. Thanks for watching this episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you like this content, please share it with your friends. Make sure you subscribe to our page and like our videos. If you want some interaction, get in the comments and we'll be sure to get back to you. If you want to know any more information about our firm or this page, you can find out in the description or visit tragoslaw.com. We post multiple times throughout the week, so make sure you hit that bell so you can get the notification and not miss out on the next episode.